So two years of almost complete radio silence has come to an end, and we've finally got another look at Breath of the Wild's upcoming sequel, including a tentative release year, 2022. While the trailer's only just under two minutes long, there's a whole lot to unpack here. So before we get into discussing what this could mean, let's run through the entire trailer and break it down shot by shot. The trailer begins with Malice, the energy of Calamity Ganon, rising slowly in a similar fashion to how the green energy moved in the game's initial trailer. As the Malice rises, we cut to a few different shots. First, we see Link, with his right arm apparently attacked by Malice. He's wearing the same tunic as he was in the initial trailer, and wields the Master Sword, meaning that this likely takes place at the same time as the first look at the game. However, this is the only time we see the Blade of Evil's Bane in the entire trailer, and it's not looking in a good way here. Perhaps the Malice attacking Link somehow damages the sword, or even breaks it entirely, explaining its absence in the rest of the trailer. After cutting back to the Malice, we see the corpse-like figure from the reveal, a figure who's most likely Ganondorf, judging by the red hair and Gerudo emblems on his person. At first, I thought he was falling, but instead, it looks more like he simply raises his arms, perhaps controlling the Malice. Interestingly, he doesn't feature a chest wound, as many people, myself included, theorised based on the original trailer. We can see more clearly, however, the holes in the palms of his hands, as well as ones on his chest. After another shot of Malice, we see Zelda falling into a huge chasm. In the initial trailer, we saw Ganondorf's awakening cause a cave-in. Huge rocks fall from the ceiling, shattering the ground where Link and Zelda stand. Later on in this original trailer, we see Link's hand catching Zelda, and later, the strange green hand catch Link, which could be what's about to happen in this scene. After the trailer cuts to black, we see a light, which parallels the light which we see at the beginning of Breath of the Wild. Next, we see Link skydiving through the clouds. Obviously, there's a parallel to Skyward Sword, but there's a lot more interesting details to unpack. First, Link himself. He seems to have longer hair than we've seen before, indicating that this takes place quite some time after the events in the caves. He's wearing a green shoulder garb, a skirt, and high sandals. And most interestingly, his right arm's looking a little different to usual, which we'll get back to later. Link's longer hair, coupled with the green clothing, have obvious connections to the hero seen in the tapestry from 10,000 years ago, when the Calamity was last sealed. Whether there's a connection here, some sort of time travel or cyclical history, remains to be seen. Below Link, we can see islands floating in the sky. We can see smaller, connected islands with trees, paths, and small shrine-like structures, and higher up, a huge structure peeks out from the clouds. Following this, we see a shot of Link paragliding. The glider itself looks to be the same one used in Breath of the Wild, although, interestingly, it now features two streamers, trailing behind. Concept art for Breath of the Wild shows that they considered using these streamers in the original game, where they'd help to indicate the direction of the wind. As it seems that we'll be gliding between floating islands in this sequel, perhaps the inclusion of these streamers means that we'll have to take wind direction into account when paragliding, similar to how the Deku Leaf works in The Wind Waker. Link's appearance is somewhat different here to when he's skydiving. He's wearing large boots and trousers instead of the sandals, but still wears the green shoulder garb. He wears a new shield on his back, featuring a design that looks somewhat similar to the Sheikah eye symbol. In the background, we can see more of the floating islands, which are notably at different altitudes. Perhaps working out how to access higher islands will be part of the game's overworld puzzles, or perhaps we'll simply do it using an ability which we see later on in the trailer. On the right, we get a better look at what's most likely the same large structure seen in the skydiving shot, which appears to be a huge stone tower, perhaps a dungeon. After this, we get an absolutely gorgeous shot of Link running on one of these floating islands, wearing the same outfit as he was in the previous shot. As he runs, three birds startle and fly away. Up above, we can see more islands, though from below, we can't really see much about what's on them. Directly in front of Link, though, there's a structure reminiscent of a Japanese tori, gates found at Shinto shrines, which normally symbolise the transition from the mundane to the sacred, meaning the structures that are built on these islands are probably somewhat sacred. Next, we see perhaps what is one of the game's bosses, a stone golem. 
The top half lowers onto a base structure, connected by rings and what appears to be the same green energy from the original trailer, meaning that whatever this thing is, it's connected in some way to the cave below Hyrule and the spectral hand. The top half of the golem looks somewhat like a frog, though features a single large eye design in the center and has two egg-like structures on its shoulders. Below this hang two decorative symbols, which look somewhat like inverted Chica eyes. The base of the golem again shows this green-blue energy in a circular design in the center, interestingly accompanied by a symbol of what looks like a broomstick. Breath of the Wild of course took many of Zelda's older enemies and reimagined them, like the Hinox and Lionel, so it's possible that this too will be a reimagined form of some classic enemy. The single Cyclopean eye, and the fact that it appears to be made of some sort of stone or metal, is reminiscent of an Igor, a recurring classic Zelda enemy, but it could just as easily be unique to this game. In the background, we get a closer look at one of the shrine-like structures, indicating that this golem appears on one of the Sky Islands. Behind the construct are pillars, both topped with the same egg-shaped structures found on its shoulders, meaning that this most likely isn't a creation of Ganondorf or some other evil, but a guardian of this Sky Temple. Next, Link paraglides past what looks like a regular Bokoblin encampment until it rises from the ground and is revealed to be built on the back of a stone talus. Each Bokoblin wields a bow, so this will most likely be a lot more challenging than a regular talus, as we'll have to avoid arrows while we take it down, or snipe the Bokoblins first. Interestingly, the Bokoblins all have far longer horns than in the original game, perhaps indicating that they're more powerful, or that there's a different enemy progression system this time around. There's not too much else to note here, except that this could mean that we'll see more of these types of remixed enemies from the original. Link looks a lot more familiar here than he did in the skies. He's wearing the same tunic that he did in the caves. Here we see Link lying on the floor, as green energy is absorbed into his right arm, not unlike what we saw in the first trailer. However, this isn't the same scene. Link is wearing different trousers and appears to be shirtless, which he wasn't in the first trailer. The ground is covered in strange markings, reminiscent of the glyphs that appeared in the green energy. Next, we're back in familiar old Hyrule, and from the looks of it, we're somewhere around Death Mountain. Link runs up a hill towards a camp populated by Bokoblins and Moblins, who, again, look a little different this time around. The Bokoblins still have strange new horns. This blue Bokoblin even wears rings on his. The Moblin seems to either be wearing a small helmet, or has an even stranger new horn. But this obviously isn't the most important detail of this shot. Link seems to be able to reverse time, and send a spiked ball rolling back up the hill to take out the enemies. At first, I assumed this was a sort of new stasis, a Sheikah Slate rune, but Link doesn't have the slate on him in this shot. Instead, he holds out his right hand, the back of which glows with a golden light. If you've played almost any other Zelda game, you'll know that a glow from the back of Link's sword-wielding hand usually depicts the Triforce of Courage, and the golden light which appears to envelop the spiked ball would support the idea that this power has something to do with the Triforce. It's notably similar to Zelda's sealing power in Breath of the Wild, where the Triforce appears on the back of her hand and she's able to eradicate Dark Beast Ganon in an explosion of golden light. Whether this new ability of Link's is related to Zelda's sealing power and the Triforce isn't clear, but it's a very strong possibility. Link's hand appears to be in its new, corrupted state here, though it's harder to tell here than in the sky shots where his entire arm is exposed. Following this, we see Link, again in the same outfit, in combat with a strange enemy clung to the ceiling of a cave. It's reminiscent of a lever, another classic Zelda enemy, though not usually one found clinging to surfaces. We get a closer look at his right arm, where it's clear that it has been altered by the green energy by this point. But more interestingly, his left arm carries a shield, a shield which features a huge stone dragon head, almost identical to the dragon heads found in Zonai Ruins. The dragon head seems to function, brilliantly, as a flamethrower. Link unleashes a torrent of fire at the enemy, which retaliates by lunging at the hero, who's forced to backflip to avoid damage. As he does, we see that the dragon is lit up by this mysterious green energy. When Link lands, the dragon appears to rotate. Link barely moves his arm, but the head turns by itself. Surrounding Link and the enemy are ruins. Behind the monster are small stone steps, not unlike those found at the springs in Breath of the Wild. 
but when the fire lights up the cavern, we can see green markings on the stone next to Link, which match with the markings on the structures on the Sky Islands. Next, we see another new ability. A green puddle shrinks into a single droplet, which rises upwards, and then we see Link, in a diving pose, leaping skyward. He's surrounded by green energy, and his right arm is glowing brightly, which makes me think that this is an ability controlled by the arm's magic. Link collides with the bottom of a floating island, but this doesn't stop him. He's able to move through the stone to the surface on the other side, leaping out of a puddle similar to the one on the ground. It's possible that this initial puddle is on Hyrule's surface, and that the following jump is a way to access the sky from down below. Here we have perhaps the best shot we see of the floating islands, which don't appear to be too far above Hyrule at this point. Below Link, we can see the trees of the Ceres Scablands, an area of Hyrule littered with trees resembling the real world Dragonblood tree, which also feature the Thundra Plateau, a structure which is obviously Zonai in origin. We get a close look at one of the island's shrine structures. Again, we see pillars topped with egg-shaped decorations. The trailer ends in much the same way that the first did. Hyrule Castle rises ominously from the ground. This time we get a closer look. The castle, in the same derelict state as it was in Breath of the Wild, is forced skyward by huge tendrils of blood-red malice, causing entire towers to fall from the citadel. The final shot is one of the castle, floating above a haze of malice as the sun sets on Hyrule. So, there's a lot in a two-minute trailer. Of course, the biggest takeaways from the new trailer are the much-theorised inclusion of abilities using Link's new arm, a concept which was considered for the original game, and the appearance of floating islands in the skies. There seems to be a huge difference between the shots on the surface, where Link looks familiar, and the shots in the skies, where Link has much longer hair and a different attire. It's possible that there'll be some sort of time jump, or time travel, in the sequel, especially considering Link's new appearance's connection to the hero from the tapestry, but we don't know enough yet to make this connection. The Sky Islands obviously weren't present in the skies during Breath of the Wild, which begs the question, where did they come from? A strong possibility is that they were always there, somewhere above Hyrule, but were obscured by what's known as the Cloud Barrier, a sacred divider created by the goddess Hylia long before Skyward Sword, which helped separate Skyloft and its surrounding islands from the surface below. There's evidence that this barrier existed even during Breath of the Wild, as we can see the dragons appear to vanish through a portal in the clouds. Another notable feature of the Sky Islands are their similarity to the Zonai ruins found on the surface. The Zonai ruins were left behind by a mysterious, powerful race of people who vanished suddenly long before Breath of the Wild. Seeing these Sky Islands with similar structures, it's possible that the Zonai weren't wiped out, but instead left Hyrule for the skies above, an idea shared by the Wind Tribe in the Minish Cap. It's suggested that the Zonai worship the dragons, for Rosh in particular, so perhaps the enigmatic tribe followed the dragons above the cloud barrier and made their homes in the skies. This analysis video was just my initial thoughts and breakdown of the new trailer, so stick around on the channel for more theories and other Breath of the Wild 2 content later on in the week. I'm so happy that we've finally seen more of this game. I absolutely love what we've seen so far. 2022 can't come soon enough. Cheers guys, and I'll see you next time.